T.S. Eliot was a 20th century poet, playwright, and critic. He is best known for his poetic work, The Wasteland. T.S. Eliot is often celebrated in academia as a poet, but his critical works have always been underestimated. But the 20th century literary tradition or the 20th century literary criticism is incomplete without T.S. Eliot because he was the one who laid the foundations of what was later on called New Criticism. What I.A. Richard said in his Practical Criticism was already pro propounded by T.S. Eliot. What um, Crowe said in his uh, New Criticism was already uh, conceptualized in the essays of T.S. Eliot. What William Empson says in Seven Types of Ambiguities was already said by T.S. Eliot in his critical works. In this sense, the critical uh, essays written by T.S. Eliot hold a lot of importance in the context of literary criticism in the 20th century. So, in this lecture, I'm going to discuss T.S. Eliot as a critic. I'm going to discuss his essays and the fundamental concepts which he developed in his uh, critical endeavors. So the first important essay is Tradition and the Individual Talent. There was a background to the ideas that T.S. Eliot is discussing in Tradition and the Individual Talent, but some of the ideas in this essay are in other essays by Eliot are unique. Before we discuss the uniqueness of T.S. Eliot as a critic, we have to discuss those general ideas which derived from formalism or from liberal humanism. What were those ideas? To cut it short, the first important idea that we have already discussed with reference to formalism was that the work of art was a whole, it was a complete object and it was not dependent on history, it was not dependent on its context, it was not dependent on the biography of the author, it was not an extension of history or philosophy. That was the general idea, very common in the literary um, in, the, in the criticism of the 20th century, and it was the impact of formalism and liberal humanism. T.S. Eliot follows this idea in his critical works, especially in tradition and the individual talent. How does he follow this idea? Uh, he gives a rationale for, for it, and he extends this idea further. He adds his own conceptions to it, and this idea becomes interesting. So, the essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent, begins with a remorse. T.S. Eliot decries the fact that tradition has always been understood in, in its negative connotations. When people talked of tradition, they talked of something that was outmoded or outdated. Eliot says that tradition has to be understood in its positive meaning. What was the positive meaning of tradition? Before he explains this idea of tradition or this concept of tradition, he throws a light on the English mentality about criticism. Uh, he throws light on the importance of criticism, why criticism is important and why there should be creative uh, 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 why there should be creative process as well as critical process, why the creative process and the critical process go hand in hand. Eliot was an important figure in uh, the movement of modernism that was dominant in the first half of the 20th century. The literary movement of formalism stood on this idea of innovations. The modernists desired innovations they were in favor of experimentation with forms of uh, literary works. 
and they wanted to make use of the available techniques provided by the Russian formalists, by the liberal humanists or by other uh, experimentalists who were uh, following these trends of uh, avant-gardism or innovations. T.S. Eliot says that the modern artist, a poet, a playwright or a novelist stands in a relation to tradition. So now he defines tradition. Tradition, he says, is the complete order of the works of art written in a language or in a culture. For example, tradition in the European context means all the literary works written in the cultural context of Europe. For example, the works written from Homer to Shakespeare, from Shakespeare to Charles Dickens, from Charles Dickens to T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound make a tradition. They make a whole. And that whole, T.S. Eliot says, is a complete order. And their order is not dependent on their specific historical conditions. For example, the works of William Shakespeare are not dependent on the cultural or the um, historical context in which these works of art were written. Those works, if they are dependent on anything, are dependent on other literary works written before Shakespeare and at the, and in the time when Shakespeare was writing. That is what makes tradition. The formalist also had this view about the work of art, that the work of art has a history of its own. So when an artist, when a poet, when a playwright or a novelist stands in relation to tradition, he does not stand in relation to history, he does not stand in relation to culture, he does not stand in relation to the, 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 the philosophies of different times and periods. He stands in relation to the, to the literary history. The literary history means that he is aware of all the works written before him. For example, if a poet is writing in the 20th century, uh, according to T.S. Eliot, the poet must have an awareness of all the major works written in that language before him or in that cultural context before him. If the poet follows only one period, he is not a mature poet, Eliot says. This, this may be just a fashion, but this could not be genuine poetry uh, for T.S. Eliot. So the poet, the playwright, or the novelist has to understand that he himself is not the source of what he writes. The source is the tradition. The source is all the works written before him. So if, if, if the artist is bound to tradition, if the artist has to follow what is written before him, if he is tied to tradition and if he cannot extricate himself from tradition, then what about innovation? What about experimentation? How is T. S. Eliot a modernist? How do we make room for a newness in the work of art if we have to strictly follow tradition? No, Eliot doesn't say that we have to strictly follow the past. We only have to be a continuation of our past. And continuation doesn't mean that we drag everything from the past. We emulate only the uh, we only emulate the artists or uh, imitate the artists who have written works before us. We have to understand the philosophy of this wholeness or the philosophy of this ideal order that T. S. Eliot is talking about. So, what does that mean? If I take an example from the aspects of the novel, which is a short book, uh, this, this idea may further be elaborated. 
And the aspects of the novel, uh, E. M. Foster gives an example. He says, imagine all the novelists who were before us, imagine the major novelists who wrote in the English language, imagine Henry Fielding, imagine Emily Bronte, imagine Charles Dickens, imagine other novelists as if they are sitting in a single room and writing their novels. What is the significance of this analogy? The significance is simple to understand. That means that the novelists who wrote in different times and different periods are not dependent on their times. Their significance is not temporal. Their significance is not bound to the cultural, social, or political context in which they wrote. Their significance is universal. Their, their works make an order, and that order transcends their times, their periods, their contexts. This was the same idea that we discussed in in, in formalism. But where is the uniqueness of T.S. Eliot? The uniqueness of T.S. Eliot is that though he also focuses on the compositional aspect of literature, the formalists also focused on the compositional aspect of literature. The compositional aspect of literature is the technical aspect of literature. The poetic process, for example, is more important for the formalists and for T.S. Eliot than the content. Because as we discussed in, with reference to Roman Jakobson, when the focus is on the message itself, it is poetry. So when the focus is on the message itself, the focus is on the compositional aspect of the work of art or literature. So though T.S. Eliot follows this idea of the formalists, he thinks that this compositional aspect of literature, this um, technical aspect of literature is tied to tradition. Without tradition, this compositional aspect of literature or this innovation in literature or um, newness in the work of art is a myth. How? Because he thinks that we are nothing but a continuation of our past. How are we a continuation of our past? There is a context to it. T.S. Eliot was of the view that Europe was bright before the First World War. Before the First World War, Europe had cultural values and European aesthetics was complete. Europe was excelling in democracy, Europe was the master of the world, but suddenly the First World War happened and then after the First World War the competition between different countries in Europe happened um, for the um, of control of the world, for the control of Africa, for the control of India, for the control of Indochina. So this competition this um, uh, arri the arrival of the First World War, the arrival of this um, cutthroat competition among nations who were culturally one, who shared the same value, who had the same religion, and suddenly they started war against one another. T.S. Eliot was disillusioned. T.S. Eliot was disillusioned. He was dissatisfied with what was happening. So this dissatisfaction or this uh, disenchantment or this disillusionment with the political conditions or the historical conditions of the times led T.S. Eliot to believe that the past was great. So if we uh, avoid our past, if we forget our past, if we throw our past to the memory hole, then we lose everything that we are. That is why it is impo important to follow tradition, T.S. Eliot says. He doesn't say these things explicitly, but these 
influences or these impacts are uh, implicit in his works, in his critical works. So, the order he says is complete. The works of art written before you are make a complete whole. So, what is your role? How do you make innovation? Okay, he says. You make readjustment in the existing order, and by virtue of that readjustment or modification, you rearrange the elements of the order that already exist. And this rearrangement of the elements, this in this modification of the elements of the order, you make innovation. So, the scope of innovation is limited. Innovation should not be wired. Innovation should not be blind. Innovation should not be without a method. If there is an innovation, if there is a desire for newness in a work of art, this desire must conform to what the past dictates. The past here means the literary history or the literary tradition. So, how does the playwright, the poet or the novelist um, do it? Eliot says that poetry is not the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings recollected in tranquility. No. That was a definition by a romantic William Wordsworth. T.S. Eliot says, this is completely wrong. T.S. Eliot doesn't agree with this definition. T.S. Eliot doesn't agree with William Wordsworth. He says, poetry is not the expression of a personality. Poetry is an escape from personality. So, how can we escape from our personality when we compose poetry? Generally, the belief is that there are emotions in our heart. The emotions, when they become powerful, we don't have control over those emotions. And the overflow of those emotions is poetry. That's the general uh, view about poetry. T.S. Eliot uh, doesn't agree to this view about poetry or literature. He says that the mind of a poet in poetic process or in literary crea creation is nothing more than a catalyst. What is a catalyst? He gives the example of platinum. A catalyst is a chemical element, a chemical substance that uh, in the presence of which a chemical reaction happens, but it do doesn't become a part of the chemical process. When the results are derived, the results do not contain the catalyst or anything of the catalyst. The catalyst only makes the reaction possible. So, the mind of the poet is a catalyst. It only makes poetic creation possible. The mind of an artist is just a catalyst. It only makes the process of literary creation or poetic creation possible. When the, the a moment of literary creation is past, when the poem, for example, is complete, when the work of art is complete, the job of the poet, the job of the artist is done. The artist has to stand there. And the artist no more counts, his biography no more counts. This is the beginning of the death of the author. When Roland Bach says that the birth of the reader must be at the cost of the death of the author, the roots of that idea are here in the works of T. S. Eliot. When he detaches the poet from his work, he has a function to perform. The function is that he is a catalyst, his mind is a catalyst. When the reaction is done, the job of the, the task of the catalyst is done and the catalyst then stands there. It has nothing to do with anything that has resulted um, in, in, in the process. So, 
poetry is not an ex the expression of a personality but an escape from it. This leads us to another important concept of T.S. Eliot, the concept of objective correlative that T.S. Eliot discusses in his essay Hamlet and his problems. What is objective correlative? If I do not express my emotions, if the em emotions are uh, charged in my heart and I am um, dictated by T.S. Eliot not to directly express my emotions, what shall I do? Should there not be emotions, feelings in the work of art and poetry? There should be, Eliot says. We cannot do without feelings or emotions, but the emotions are not a direct expression. The emotions are evoked in the minds of the readers. How are the emotions evoked if I do not express them in an emotional way? Eliot says there is a way that is the uh, objective correlative. Okay. Objective correlative is uh, a situation, certain events are a set of objects in the external world that lead us to experience the emotion or the feeling that the poet or the artist wants to invoke in us, to evoke in us. So what is the poet's job? The poet has to create that situation. The poet has to uh, create that set of objects. The poet has to create that series of events which evoke the intended feeling or the desired feeling in the minds of the readers. Eliot says in Hamlet in his problems that the play by William Shakespeare is a failure, is an artistic failure. How? Because he says, Shakespeare fails to create an objective correlative in, with, um, in, in the context of Hamlet. Hamlet, he says, is confused to be or not to be. That is the question. He, he, he suffers from contradictions, Eliot says. Those contradictions are directly expressed in language, but that is not the way of the poet. Shakespeare has to create an external situation or he has to create a set of objects or events which evoke that feeling in the mind of Hamlet in the minds of the readers. So only then the play would be an artistic success. If the poet or the drama artist fails to do it, his work is an artistic failure, says uh, T.S. Eliot. So, when the poet creates a work of art, or when um, an author uh, creates a work of art, uh, when an artist creates a work of art, he has to escape from his personality by uh, creating a situation or uh, creating a set of objects or a series of events which evoke the intended emotion or feeling in the mind of the audience, not by giving direct expression to his emotions, but by, you know, indirectly manip manipulating the environment around the, around the character or around the uh, poetic process, the poet can achieve this goal, T.S. Eliot says.